they said, when you get home, it doesn't look like a business store. Fair enough. But I felt that it, it wasn't about that. What it was about was me really showing you and you understanding and, and seeing what the intent was about the subject, what this person who designed it was about. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy Devers, and this is Clever. Today, I'm talking to Murray Moss. Oh, man. How do I even describe Murray Moss? He's not easily categorized, and he's professionally fluid. Some might say he's a retailer, gallerist, or curator, but I think of him as more of a design impresario. I'll explain. He studied drama at NYU and started out as a theater actor, which is where he met his longtime partner and collaborator, Franklin Getchell. And then in 1978, he launched a fashion label called Moss Shamask with Rinaldus Shamask and opened a store on Madison Avenue to showcase the collection. This got him some notoriety as well as his first foray into retail environments. Then, in 1994, he opened the now legendary design boutique Moss in Soho and in doing so, ushered in a new era of global high design appreciation. Moss, the store, was really more of a theater of design than a typical retail shop or gallery. Murray would travel the world meeting people, bringing back design objects, which he thought of as souvenirs of relationships, and theatricalize them in elaborate and provocative displays, treating them as characters in a drama. About the store, he even says that every day was opening night. The splash that Moss made during that time absolutely carved a path for our nation's cultural acceptance and appreciation of high design and lit up the scene. Plus, he made the careers of many talented, now famous designers. You can read all about it in Please Do Not Touch, the book that chronicles the story of Moss, which he co-authored with Franklin. These days, the both of them have settled into the Torpedo House, an historic residence in Connecticut, which they operate like a gallery and office for their retail consultancy, Moss Bureau. And they are in year two of a pedagogical collaboration with RISD, Rhode Island School of Design, called Game Changers, which is designed to facilitate interdisciplinary practices. All that, and he's also a delightful human. Here for yourself, here's Murray. My name is Murray Moss, and I live in Hamden, Connecticut, um, just outside of New Haven, for the last two years. And prior to that, I lived in New York. I'm a consultant, like the rest of the world, like all of us are, everybody. But um, sometimes they say I'm a counselor because it means the same thing, but it sounds kind of, oh, you know, something maybe else. Really, I'll do anything. <laughs> <laughs> and so what I usually, if, if somebody will bring up our little company and I'll say um, to Franklin, um, uh, so what do you do? Uh, our answer is always, what are you looking for? Because whatever that they say that is, that's what we do. Uh, basically, what we do, what I do now is we work with museums is one of the things. I hate, hate, hate museum shops. I hate the concept of a museum shop that should, should not exist because it's not about a, a generic, ubiquitous kind of thing. It's about the museum shop of which museum, of a particular museum. So the souvenirs of that, or the remembrances, the keepsakes, whatever you want to call them, of whatever is being offered in that situation should be tied to what is supposed to be souvenirs and keepsakes and memories of. And not just the same old, everybody has a refrigerator magnet in the shape of a pat of butter. Like, that's just stupid. And I, I, I hate those places. We were invited by the first the Glass House to do something, you know, the Philip Johnson place. And um, we, they had a very, very modest budget, but we did something that was just cleaned it up and gave it a focus. Because why not pick something and just have that, you know, the things sort of sort of rotate around that thing. And we picked something that was, I felt, very much the heart of what the place was about in the abstract. And that worked really well. They, they, they started, I mean, it was like kind of night and day. Okay. So then we got this job for the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. I came up with a system, you know, to, to do that shop with Franklin. 
And then I, I, we were supposed to do it a year, and I said, the good thing is we're not trying to make you dependent on us. If it works, you'll have, you, you could just plug, it's modular. Like I made it a backstage thing where you could just fill in these blanks periodically, and, and you don't need us. Five years later, we're still there. Oh. Because many things I've done in my life have not worked. This worked. I don't know why, but like, and they were, cause they were written up as like the most, inventive and well curated place in the in the museum shop in the country okay so now we, we've been working for five years to keep inventing more and more and more and then we started to work with the jewish museum which was kind of interesting for me because to be perfectly i'm jewish but i know nothing about judaism absolutely nothing and so i had to actually kind of hire somebody on my own to advise me because they would go what kind of products are you suggesting for sure harat or whatever the thing would be called, okay? And I would go, well, let me get back to you. And I'd call me this guy, and I would say, can you tell me what is that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, four years into that, it's four years later, and we're still working on it, you know, and it's slowly evolving, but it, like actually in a couple of weeks, it'll be totally finished for a very modest amount. Again, it's, that is a really good transformation. That, that really, and they are jumping. I mean, the place is going well. So, and I, I feel like we're kind of doing something that we like, you know, it's, it's, I like doing that. So can you share with us where you grew up and what your family was like and what kind of a kid you were? I'm 70, so I was born in 1949. And, um, uh, I was born in, in Chicago. There were five kids, so I have four siblings. One of them has died, so I have three living and one not living. Um, my mom and dad died many years ago. I grew up in Chicago proper, you know, but then um, when I, we were nine, I was nine, I think, we moved to the suburbs because my sis, my older sister, uh, Jean, uh, was she was four years older, so she was about to enter high school and the inner city schools were not good. And so people were sort of fleeing to the, to the burbs. So that's what my parents did. And because we were Jewish, we couldn't buy, they were restricted, you know, certain areas. They just said, we can't sell to you because you're Jews. So my parents had to build a house. So they built this (laughs) house, which was, um, it was kind of, my father was a um, electrical engineer, but he, he manufactured extra equipment. He had a, a manufacturing. Uh, by the time I was eight or nine, um, they were they were doing well. My oldest brother was born, first born. Uh, things were, you know, economically not great. And they lived in a little apartment and blah, blah, blah. By the time I was born, they were, it was on their way, you know, they were kind of wealthy. So they built this house. My dad built it, was, was engineered. He was very shall we say, one track about that. He had no interest in, in, or even awareness that there was a decor or there was just a position of object. He just didn't, because they never had anything, you know, and he wasn't interested in it. They, they divided up the labor. What they did was he took total responsibility for the house building, okay? So, and, and the kind of windows, the kind of everything that would be, you know, all the, the, the tech, technical stuff. Uh, we had acoustical ceiling, and it was very early days, tacky. It was like almost like a kind of Corbusier thing without him being aware of it. Okay. okay? And, and, and uh, my mother, she was, let's say, more interested in wanting to be correct because this was a big leap for us, you know? And she just didn't, she wanted it to be perceived as that it was in good taste, and we were fine, and we were quiet, and it was good. So she had a decorator. And the decorator was somebody who actually wound up working for all of my siblings, not for me, but it, he became like an institution <laughs> and, and because he would put up with anything. And so in the dining room, for example, we had a, my father felt that it was impo- old fashioned, let's say, to just have water glasses because he felt that would be, you'd have to run a dishwasher at that time we had a dishwasher it was 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 wasteful. So he put in a pedal foot pedal operated water fountain in the dining room, a formal dining room. And so what ha- he insisted on it, you know. So my mom inherited that, as did the decorator, because 
you know, it was odd because, you know, somebody, we have a dinner party and somebody get up, want to drink water, they had to get up, go to the water fountain and get a drink from the water fountain. <laughs> it was kind of, you know, that was kind of like odd, okay? And, and of course, as, as being like a 10, 11 year old, I just wanted to be like everybody else. <laughs> so people would come over and we were kind of like the odd ones. But the decorator was genius and my mom really rose to the occasion and they, they put it in the kumquat role. Like they made a little, I don't know, that doesn't sound like a good solution, but it was very intensive. And it was sort of nice because you didn't slurp the water like in front of everybody else. You had a little privacy. But it was stuff like that. Um, he had, we had, uh, uh, I hated the intercom system. You know, all this had an impression of me. Like they, we had an intercom system so they could, my parents could listen in on you in your room. I mean, then it was like we had sliding doors between the bedrooms. So it was, I mean, it was just all odd, but nice. I mean, it was nice, but it was it, odd. I mean, it does and, sound like an electrical engineer did the designing of it. Yeah. <laughs> well, there was a laboratory in the basement. Oh, um, wow. and, a dark, and that was the one thing that it, it did have a sort of, I must say, a little bit of a negative thing because we, my sister, my twin sister and I were the ones that, would have to go down to the basement occasionally to be sort of the models for this extra equipment. Like my father, you know, they had to determine gauges and for head size and stuff. So he would do that on us. And I never liked that very much. It was creepy and scary. Oh. So um, it was that, that all that was floating around in the ether from the time that I would say 10 to 18, you know, mm-hmm. when I came to New York. I'm close now to my older brothers. I never was, ever, because there was too much of an age difference. But I, I was very, very close to my sister Jean and my, my twin sister. But my sister Jean, like I said, passed away a number of years ago. And so, How would you describe your relationship with your parents? Did you feel understood and safe yeah. and supported? I felt totally supported, not at all understood, you know, but... My parents, I mean, basically, I had a really good time, okay? We, <laughs> they, they were very, 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 very generous. My mother was totally dedicated to being a mother. You know, we had everything we wanted. There was plenty of money. With a, you know, when I was 16, I guess, and I got my driver's license, I said I wanted a, a blue Thunderbird convertible, and they bought it, okay? Wow. <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't obnoxious. It was just they were very, very, very caring. Um, except my father wasn't there at all. He wasn't actually very present. But that's that's his. Thing. That's the whole thing. And um, but but they were they were very nice people. They just had their own issues, and they were not in any way helicopter parents like you would have today. Right. They just afraid. You know, they hover. Gen- generationally, parents, that wasn't how people parented back then. No. I mean, my parents never, I applied to college on my own. They never knew where I applied. I was accepted. They didn't understand. I never had a conversation with them. I never visited with them, the thing. They they never came to see me. I, I remember I got packed a suitcase, got on the plane, and went to, to New York. And um, I was two months early. I checked into a hotel. They didn't know any of this. You know, it was <laughs> like, <laughs> so there was a certain distance. But my mother was very, um, let's say, kind of proper. She was a very lovely person. But like when I once, when, when one of my aunts died, my mother didn't say anything to us, didn't inform us. And I asked her why she would not have told me. And she said, well, she didn't like to gossip. Okay. Oh. So, <laughs> there was a certain amount of decoding you had to do as well, because what was considered proper also meant that... You, you had to figure out this, the context on your own. You know, it was much more hands-on, let's say, in the earlier years with my brothers. Um, by the time we were the fourth and fifth came along, and my parents were 40, they had stuff to do. My dad was totally, you know, that was his beginning. Because, you know, so he, he was 40 years old, and he was off on a good run. And so he was not around. I mean, we were close emotionally, but they, we didn't know each other at all. I mean, I was with Franklin for 48 years, you know, and I would say after 30 years or so, um, you know, he actually met my parents. But it was like they were they were not really around or Whoa. available in that way. Wow. Okay. Uh, so, so that was that was bad. 
I mean, all in all, I was really lucky to have a, I was well-educated, well-fed, and and kept healthy. I want to ask you about that uh, convertible Thunderbird. It was a Thunderbird, right? 1965, Thunderbird convertible, baby blue leather seats. The top hat was automatically go down. I loved it. <laughs> but that's because I would put the end in it was air conditioned. Yes, it was because I wanted it. I read about it and I wanted it. And and so they did it. But then we got rid of it very soon afterwards because my father was totally enamored of the Volkswagen, the Beetle. Oh, and we I made see. a trip. We made a, a trip to Germany, in fact, where he bought, I'm trying to remember, something like eight of them. And the, we had a Carmen Ghia and we had the band. We had the whole range of Volkswagen. And we brought, he, he, he wouldn't let them out of his sight. And he, he felt that everyone should be driving and only driving a Volkswagen. So, so people would think, you know, we didn't have garage space like that. So we, they were all outside in the, in, the, in the driveways. And people would stop and ask, you know, like, do we, are we a car wash for the Volkswagen? <laughs> like, it was, there was always something weird like that. That didn't go good with my Thunderbird. So I have a, I have a very serious question, which is um, your teenage years, you get your driver's license. You ask for a Thunderbird. Are you finding that you're expressing yourself through objects already and through the curation of objects? And was there tension? I was doing that from what I was, I would say, five. Okay. And so when your father sort of curated over your head with Volkswagen over your Thunderbird, what did that feel like? Well, my father was looking at totally a different aspect. My father would always say, I love this car because it doesn't have anything to go wrong. And I was interested in, like, the first, I remember the first thing that I did that was sort of like, Designy kind of uh-huh. was I, I. They gave me permission to redecorate my room. This is an old house, the house we were born in in Chicago. And I went. We went to every Sunday, pretty much. We would go to the Golden Pheasant, which was a Chinese restaurant in Chicago's Chinatown. And I, they had a little gift area, and I bought my things from their gift shop, <laughs> and uh, I made my room into a an Asian. Yeah. Okay. That sounds amazing. Was, it, was, it, was, it was. I had the. I had the. The emperor and empress dolls. I had the bobbing pencil heads. <laughs> and the only tricky thing was, I, it had previously been uh, a farm look. So there was like a farm um, <laughs> mural on the wall, which was difficult to make Chinese. <laughs> but 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 it, it, it. I mean, I put on things myself, but as far as I was concerned, I had a new look. <laughs> and I remember that very distinctly. Um, you know, it was because see, I, they didn't really care. Like it was, uh, as I said, they were sort of not the opposite of helicopters. So it wasn't. There was no discussion about this or no inquiry. It was just okay, fine. You know. Yeah, there's a certain freedom to parents that are slightly checked out. <laughs> And you, you had told me that you sort of decided where you were going to go to school. And then what did you study in school? Where did you go? And tell me about the college years. It was 1968. So and I was at Columbia University. Oh, wow. So the topic of the day was the fact there was a revolution on campus that became quite iconic, you know, in and of itself. So that was, plus I was in, I thought I was hot shit, to be honest. I thought I was, I was well-traveled because we traveled a lot prior. And I was 18, I thought I was really sophisticated. And I was nothing compared to these three other guys who were my dorm mates. Like there was two rooms, like a suite of rooms, and there were two guys in each room, but it was connected. I was like from the sticks because this one guy, I remember, he would always go to bed when I would be waking up. He'd stay up all night. And he never went to class. And at one point I said to him, how are you going to do this? How are you going to pass? And he said to me, I'm not worried about that. My father owns Hawaii. What? <laughs> Plus we were the drug center of Columbia University in 1968, my room. I never took any drugs because I, I just knew I would never come back or something, you know. But we were the drug that they were big deal they were the biggest dealer on campus was one one of our, one of my roommates. 
So, and plus there was the revolution, you know, the thing, the occupying of the buildings. And, wow. and, and so all that was going on in my first year. So that, I can't really remember too much else about what it was, my ex- college experience, except I got off of campus. You could, you could live off campus as of your second year. So I did that. Okay. College was horrible. I mean, it was like I burned the building down because when I had this, my first apartment, I shared it with four other guys again, but different guys. And, um, by my, my bed, I, I had a little table and my mother had given me to take to New York a fondue set yes. because she thought that would be necessary, you know, <laughs> for whatever reason, socially or whatever she felt like, yeah. So, you're going to so need this, delight. son. You're going to need, at some point, you're going to need to do fondue, so. <laughs> she gave me that and she gave me a Revere water kettle. Those are the two things. I don't know why, but like, and they came, frankly, I had that water kettle until just a couple of months ago when I left it on and forgot I had it on and it burned it up. Oh, no. But um, I had it all those years, but the fondue was long gone because I had the, I burned the building down. Oh, my gosh. Because, because I didn't know how to do fondue. And instead of a candle, you know, that you put in the thing, I put lighter fluid. So it was not good. But the things like that, it, you know, and then, I, so then I, I basically got out of Columbia and I went to NYU School of the Arts. What my parents did say was that they were fine, I'd go wherever I want to go, but they suggested that I do at least two years of general studies at, you know, a proper university thing. And then if I wanted to switch to the School of the Arts at NYU, that would be okay. So that's what I did. But it was pointless. I hated Columbia. I, I really, I hated every minute of it. But NYU put me down on 7th Street and 2nd Avenue. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, at that time, 20 years old, I guess. And I'm on 2nd Avenue next to the Fillmore East, which was the place for, you know, the wild music and everybody was there. Yeah. And the drug scene was huge. And it was sort of the opposite experience of like I own Hawaii. It was totally different. And I, and my teacher for all those years, which we had an intense relationship, was Olympia Dukakis. Okay? Wow. <laughs> and so, so, so that's when it got really interesting because... So you're Olympia studying drama was, there at NYU? Yeah, I was an actor. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. And I always wanted to be, and I, so I was an actor. The training was about... It was a raw period, you know, very raw. And we would laugh at the people at the proper sort of academy of theater and mm-hmm. music oh, was at Lincoln Center. And I was down at the scruffy, in the dirt kind of training, which was NYU with Olympia. Because Olympia, you'd, you'd actually find yourself occasionally like punching each other, rolling around on the floor. Once she threw somebody out the window, <laughs> it was like, so, so, but I loved it. And yeah, so I this was, sounds I, incredible. Yeah, it was great. But then, and I did well, but I was always cast as the insane person because I would do anything. So I, my first year was basically in a straitjacket for because all the scenes I was doing was a, a loony tune, and um, and that is the most serious education I think I ever had. That was the time when I really learned something, um, which was. If you're going to do it, do it, you know, mm-hmm. like do Com- it. Commit. And um, so that, that and, and I built on that any metaphor, any job I was ever doing was based on that because the theater, you know, wasn't fucking around. It was like, that was, I wouldn't believe me. Those were, that was like, that's the best theater I've ever seen was when I watched other people working in that class ever seen. It was like amazing what she, what she did. But but I had to stop because I would die. I mean, I thought I would die. Well, Julia, I mean, they were learning how to walk in period costumes. We were learning how to, like, throw people around the room and punch them. You know, it was, like, a totally different thing. And, of course, no one in my class went on to be actors. All the famous actors of that era were were at Juilliard. (laughs) But that that lesson in commitment, I think, is a really important one. Because the audience can pick up if you're not fully, if you're not fully in it, if you're not fully committed to it, then nobody cares. Nobody cares. Yeah. yeah. Nobody cares. But see, the things that I love about the theater 
is there are rules. It's a it's a give and take. It's a it's a it's a fifty fifty. You agree as the audience to follow my rules because it's only under operating under those rules that I'm going to be able to deliver to you what you want and expect. So you can't talk. You can't bring your dog. You can't bring a sandwich. You have to turn your phone off and you have to sit in the dark, possibly next to a stranger. Mm -hmm. Okay. In return, I'll give you everything I've got. And that's the deal. That's what I like. You know, you can't, you, you, they force you to look in one direction. You can't sit in facing another direction. You can't, you're made uncomfortable if you're in the middle of it. You want to stand up and go to the bathroom as a pain customer of whatever the service is that we're not used to that well you, you know? also have to pay we're, in advance and you don't get a refund if you didn't, if you didn't right. care for right. the exactly yeah for the service <laughs> so so but that was the model that i used for the store because i thought i like the theater model because but then you got to really deliver but i was prepared i would do anything to deliver but because then that i made them do this go through this and i felt if you come into my place I'm going to give you everything I've got, but you have to, in order for me to do that, you have to sit in the car and take the ride. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the way it is. After school, you you went out into the world and became an actor for a while, correct? Yeah, yeah. That was also a fortunate time because that was a time where the actor was king. And it was heavily funded by the, I forgot what the the title of this fund was, but it was government funded. Mm -hmm. And I was working with this great people, um, Joe Joe Chaikin, Joseph Chaikin, and the Open Theater with Andre Gregory. And uh, so I was part of that. You know, we would work for like two years on a piece and we would create the the dialogue. And then then Wally, Wally Sean, um, who's this guy who's, I think he does acting now, but he, Wally is a fantastic writer, and Wally was um, uh, the playwright, and he would he would write the play according to what we were doing in improvisation. We were always barefoot, so I refer to it as the barefoot days. Then we would rehearse for two years, then we would perform at the performing garage. It was really cool. I, I really enjoyed it. I was then in this Shakespeare company where we were funded to go to be in an American company studying with the Royal Shakespeare Company in in Stratford. And um, so then we, we went to England for, say, a year and a half or something, and then came back and performed in the United States. It was a good thing. I enjoyed it a lot. And that's where you met Franklin. So that's the beginning of a very long-term relationship yeah, for you. Yeah, that was in 1972, I think. We would go to together to acrobatics class. <laughs> I remember we, we, we studied with this guy, Chuck Kelly, Charles Kelly, who was the best in the city. And at the time, if you were an actor, you had to be, you had to be able to do a backflip. So we would go, and then but it was in like an office building with small little rooms. So you didn't have time to do the prep run. There was no space to do the prep run for the tricks. So we would go out, I remember I'd go out to the hallway, all the way to the elevators, and then I'd start my my run, and I'd run, turn in quarters, run, run. And when you get to the doorway of the room, then you have to do your trick really fast, or else you hit the wall. <laughs> but all this with the time was like totally normal. You know, it was like it was so funny. It was you made up your own characters, of course. We wrote this play called The Fable. Joe Chaikin directed it, and I came up with an idea. You, you know, you develop your own character, and I came up with the idea that I would be the man who lives under a rock. So that was the stupidest thing, because I was in a cardboard box for a year after that, <laughs> you know, because I was in a rock. So for a, I spent a full year in a cardboard, hot cardboard box. So that didn't work so well. And those kinds of poor choices <laughs> got me out of that business, let's say, when I was about 28. So you and Franklin... I assume are together since you met and yeah. did Franklin stay in the business while, when you got yeah. out, when you were 28 or did you guys go out together? Well, he, he got out, he got out just before oh, and okay. uh, he went to television and what happened? And then I started the fashion company. <laughs> yeah. I want to hear but, about but, this fashion company and oh, man. how did you transition like, from theater? I mean, it makes sense, but, it also seems like it takes a lot of guts. 
it was the stupidest thing, but I'm very, very glad I did it. That led us to the 80s, which was my favorite decade, Frank, and here's two, because at the time when I was 28, um, and I stopped acting, it did coincide with the fact that I sort of came into a lot of cash. So I thought, hell, now you know, I could do, what am I going to do? But I like to work. You know, I always like to do something. Mm -hmm. So a friend of mine said, hey, you're kind of rich. Why don't you meet a friend of mine who's a fashion designer and start a fashion company? And I went, sure, sounds great. So I met this guy, Ron Ronaldo Stramovsky, and he was great. He actually was great. And so I, I started a fashion company called Moss Shamask, and I opened up a store on Madison Avenue at 70th Street called Moss, created to house the entire Shamas collection. <laughs> and uh, this was in 1979, I think. Spring was when we opened. Then I completely lost all my money very quickly. And then it was like 12 years of hard labor to bring it back, you know. But I, I actually, that was the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. Because like, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. But but I, I we got it together. And then... Um, were you figuring I, it out a, as you went along? Is is that what you mean? No, I was just dying every day. I was like, because it's really hard. To, because the problem was we opened, okay, in the spring of 79. And the next day, a whole review came out by Bill Cunningham, who wrote that the biggest rave you've ever read. And it said, I remember distinctly the phrase was ceremonial, what was it? Special raiment for the ceremonial private life. That was what he called what it was. So we had everybody coming over, but I didn't know. We were making them by hand, one by one. Oh, so, you couldn't keep so up. How do you make that? Yeah. yeah we, we were, we, we did it, I mean, it was insane. So then I went to Italy and found production, and then I spent most of that decade in Italy, um, uh, you know, trying to make these clothes. And then I wanted to, I sold it to a, to a company, uh, when I was 40, I was fin I was out of that business. Okay, but would you say and that's where you really learned how to run a business or what, what running a business involves? Well, it was certainly reality, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was really, 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 really hard. But um, I got out of it, and it was okay. And I was a little bit famous, you know, like as Ron sort of went on to become very well known, but because we were like young and we had the hooks but it had this thing and we were up there with we were we were at the cover of Women's Wear Daily. We were totally in the big leagues. But we didn't have the knowledge. I didn't have the knowledge and I didn't have that much money to, to I, how could I compete with Rob Laura, you know? And that's what it was, or Calvin Klein. I mean it was impossible. So I was very glad that it worked out. But then then I was back in business, but I was, what was I going to do? And I didn't want to be a fashion executive, you know? So I, that's when, because I had spent so much time in Italy, there was a connection between me and these objects. I see. And uh, my, I, my original idea was to, to not have a store ever, but to, I approached all the fashion. I knew a lot of the fashion executives. So, so I went to the heads of the Mitsukoshi, Neiman Marcus, Bergdorf Goodman, Texas Avenue, and I said, why don't you hire me to begin a sort of product division because you have the window space, you have the, the, the display people, you have it all in place, you have the pages committed to advertising, I could just bring you the stuff and it, it's going to go there. And nobody would do it. Because they needed and somebody uh, to show them what it was? Or why do you just, think... They, they had no interest whatsoever. And... I even, I had, we had this nice apartment and I set up a store in the apartment to like, look like kind of like a store because I wanted to show people how it would look and nobody liked the idea. What was that, so thought, that store called? I think I've heard of it. Charavari. Yeah. That was Selma Weiser who was, to me, she was like a, a tough person who raised her sons, you know, and son and daughter alone, and she lived on the Upper West Side, and she opened up Charavari, and she single-handedly brought over Yoji and all the Japanese designers. It was Selma who did it, and Selma was old school, and I loved her, and she had this raspy cigarette-like voice, 
And she would call me regularly, Murray, I need Mark to have my She's almost like the real deal. And Selma then had a stroke. And when her son took over, he asked me, uh, he invited me. I said, I want to do the story. I said, well, why don't you do it here? And the one on Madison Avenue, the Char- they had many Charvaris at the time. They'd gone out of business. But so then I opened up a, a, a thing there called Obar Ojeti. Mm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Because you get it, there was a coffee bar and then you, Italian coffee and my little object, okay? Yes. And yes. The first, and I did an exhibition to open it with um, Angelo Mangiarotti, a, set of, a, a collection of glassware. And Harry Allen, I found in a magazine, I asked him to, for nothing, you know, to design the store. He went out to design the first moss and the second one. Yeah, so we so, interviewed Harry Allen and he told us about this. So this is nice. Connective tissue. Yeah, it was that was quite a thing. He did a brilliant job with the Charavari. But then Charavari, we only did that, I think, three months. And then they carried it on. It was going good. But I, I decided at that point I would just open the store myself. Yes. Because okay. I, did, I didn't really like collaboration on that level like that. So Moss in Soho, which you operated for nearly 20 years, was a tremendous curatorial stage for you but I mean I it can't be understated how influential it was in terms of global high design what I'm interested to know is what key insights do you take from that whole chapter and that might not be apparent on the surface you know or or how do you think we should understand what happened there and try and frame the phenomenon in terms of historical context I never intended to have it be a big thing because I was 40 when I sold the fashion thing. So I was like, I was 45 when I opened up Moss, the store. So I was already 45 years old. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I, I just wanted to express myself. Okay. Which is why I called it Moss and not Moss. 20th century design, not anything like that. I just called it Moss because I couldn't make a mistake that way. Like if I woke up and I liked cuckoo clocks, then I would buy all those cuckoo clocks. And that's because I couldn't go wrong because I would always be on brand because the brand was me. Right, right. And I knew that I would keep changing because I was 45 and I've already gone through so many changes. So I felt, why don't I just have that where... I won't go wrong if I if I just follow my own heart, you know. And so I, it was very personal. I thought, today I'll jump out, I'll go look at something, and then if I love it, I'll do only that compulsively. Like, I, I don't, there's no balance. I, I didn't care. I didn't want to have any balance. I didn't want to, I tell people, you know, I'm not the UN gift shop. I'm like, my, I don't have to balance anything. I don't, people would complain. You don't have enough women working here. You don't have anything from Panama. You don't have anything made out of this material. You know that. And I say, whoa, it's called moss. It's like follows what I am am compulsively interested in or not. It's not a normal store. And it's, it's all at my risk. I'm doing it myself. So that's what you get. And that, because I, I, I just, that was where I was at that point in my life. And um, it was... I, you know, when I think, and I, I built it on the on the theater, a theatrical metaphor, which was, I felt that things at that time needed to be elevated, theatricalized, which people, a lot of people shot down, you know, but I said, they said, when you get it home, it doesn't look like it did in the store. Fair enough. But I felt that it, it wasn't about that. What it was about was, me really showing you and you understanding and, and seeing what the intent was about the subject, what this person who designed it was about. Mm-hmm. And that was, was what I was interested in. So, it's like you're seeing the objects as characters. Yes. Well, I'm seeing them as souvenirs of people. So, so somebody made a chair, okay? Well, I never had a chair department because, like everybody else did, because I thought... Well, nobody needs me. What's my contribution to tell you that it's, this is a chair in case you make a mistake and think it's a lamb? <laughs> like, you know, what, what, and what am I going to do? What am I here for? Just mm-hmm. to be the guy between you and the chair unless you give me $500? So, 
So what I felt was what I would do is contribute something. That's how egotistical I was. So I felt that I would show you the, I would find the hidden grief, if there was one, that a designer buried for free inside of this chair. Mm -hmm. And then I would talk about that, not about it being a chair. So maybe I would put it in a case with a fruit bowl and a candlestick because they were all made out of polished aluminum or because they were all red, you know? So I would, I would get off of the, of, I would, I would focus on something that you maybe wouldn't have known to look for because it's not in most people's interest, most merchants interest to do that. That's what kind of worked much to my surprise. I hadn't thought about it, but because that's of course very endearing, makes one very endearing to a designer, mm -hmm. you know, it's, and a manufacturer. I, I'm compulsive. You know, I, I went in there every day, very early in the morning. I would clean. Well, at, at the beginning, it was my only employee. And I would clean everything. I would sweep Green Street. I would clean the street. I would repaint the store every week. Mm. And even to the last day that we were open, like 18 years later, you know, People would come in and say, did you just open? Because to me, it was like every day was opening night. Every day was the first day. That was because that's who I am. Like, that was, that was just my compulsion. And it was good for business because nobody else would be willing to do that. Like, there not a lot of people. It was crazy, you know, but, but uh, it suited me, so. I think that unique, very specific, personal it was you. It was Moss. And therefore, you had permission to do whatever you wanted to do. And you didn't force yourself to follow any sort of consensus. So it could have a very, very strong character. And in doing so, you created a platform for a lot of people to really understand, appreciate and see design for a lot of its inherent value, which was maybe not being perceived before. It's very nice of you to say, and very generous. I do think that, again, inadvertently, I was just doing my thing, you know, but and but inadvertently, I do, I, I'm continuing to be surprised that, first of all, it, it had some effect on people because I wasn't really aware of it at the time. I would come home from a market or something and I'd say to Franklin, I can't believe it, you know, I met this person and they heard of us. And it was like, he would go, well, yeah. I wasn't really conscious of that I ever. I was like, I can't believe that people, you know, look who came in. I can't believe it. It's like really weird. So that's what I think is really great about this is you, you committed to something which was a vision, but you didn't commit to the outcome because you had no idea what that would be. You just committed to the well, expression. Well, what I committed to, which I think was unusual, was not being a brand. In other words, I never stayed the same. I never protected my brand. If I was, I was a diehard modernist, then I'd go to Germany because a friend of mine takes me to this Nuremberg, mm -hmm. and I'd go look at the porcelain, and suddenly I was overwhelmed. I was passionate about 18th century porcelain. So then I did, I brought in 18th, I thought, I'll bring in the porcelain. And then people were furious at me, like, are you jerking us around? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I said, well, today I, I realized that I was a prisoner of modernism. And I had nothing figural in my life, nothing lovely, nothing fragile. Everything was in, to make me as invulnerable as possible. And I realized that, that I don't want to lose that vulnerability. So, yes, I'm going to be selling porcelain, 18th century porcelain. And glassware, you know, from Vienna, blah, blah, blah. And then it, everybody, then it did get on board. I knew that I would change. Who doesn't, you know, over all those years? And I was prepared to take the whole story with me because that was the whole premise. Right. Was, you know, I didn't have to keep it the way it was because people don't like to change. You know, I didn't want to, I didn't do that. That's not what I did. By following your curiosity, a lot of us got to go along for the ride. Do you do you look back on those years with fondness? Oh yeah, I really had a fabulous time. Um, I was aware that something odd was happening. That that it was like I was an actor who made it. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like because <laughs> this was my audience, and I was and I was getting a lot of. I was like a star. Yeah, and it was like. Wow, I, I really, really enjoyed it. Totally, thoroughly. Well, it was 
And when you get a sense of how many lives you're touching, it starts to feel really, the word I keep thinking is effective, which sounds so sterile, but, but you're having an effect and that is personally empowering somehow. Again, it was the people like, I never imagined they would talk, I would meet these people, you know, and I was like in the scene. I was, in fact, I was the scene for a number of years. Like, I couldn't believe this. And I fed on that. I, I really enjoyed it because it was exactly like I had, like I was a, 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 an actor star. That's what it was. I had an audience to play to and they were liking it. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, it was, it was that. And I got to hang around with the cool people and, you know, I mean, it was um, ama- amazing. It really was. That, that's what was my reward. That's what I, take away from that is those experiences you know and the friendships that I still have with people and that that's what it was about and that not the things really I'm not so interested in the things it was just the the fact that there was something to be communicated about this thing Mm -hmm. and that I actually figured out how to do it and I was willing to do it and and people liked it you know And, and I thought why does them where is everybody like this seems to be working, you know, why are other people doing this? And I think it's just because it's scary if you're not accustomed to it, you know, and also it's too much work. I mean, it's way too much work. You know? <laughs> but, 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 but then see when I was doing this, Franklin was in, decided to jump into television and he became a television producer. He was the producer of Sesame Street. So by the time you know, the eighties were ending, we were like high rollers and it was fantastic because, you know, we were equal sort of status in our fields. He won a, an Emmy and, and we were like having a great time. And the best thing was the clothes. The Armani suits had those giant shoulder pads yeah. and, and the neckties. We had like thousands of them. It was really fun. <laughs> it was really, really, that was a great, that was a great decade. That particular decade. <laughs> so, and you've you've documented that era of your life with Franklin in the book. Please do not touch. Basically, yes, yes. Okay, we did that. Yeah, we did it. You know, we didn't write that together. We wrote it individually for over, let's say, around two years. We never shared what we were writing. We 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 did it as a fugue. Like we would both be telling. We figured the same stories now and then, but we would be telling from our own point of view. It was a tough thing, but we felt that we would tell our own story and see how they go if you put it together. The publisher at first hated it, as they hated it. But then um, we went and wrote more, and then he came around totally and was very supportive of it, which was great. I, I never wanted to do it. Uh, I just, I'm glad we did because it was a process that was very moving. A summation thing, and I don't think we would have been able to move on if we hadn't actually done that, it's like a ritual. Yeah, you know, yeah I can not, see ah. that. So you have so, moved on. I mean, I want to talk a little bit about Torpedo House and Moss Bureau, which is your design <laughs> consultancy, but also your collaboration with RISD because you're in year two of an academic yeah. collaboration with Rhode Island yeah. School of Design. Yeah which I think is a very natural fit. And I'm excited for the students who get to participate in that. And I wonder how you're approaching academia and what your takeaway Um, uh, is. (laughs) You know, we moved, first of all. We we, we left New York and moved to Connecticut. And um, we moved to this, what is considered, I guess you'd call it a bedroom community of Yale, we, we didn't think about that, as we never did in other places we've lived. We just liked the house, and we just thought, for various practical reasons, we wanted to be near, like, good conversations, but not in a city. We wanted to be, you know, have access to doctors and things, but we didn't want to be in, like, a big city either. So it, it, it actually worked out kind of perfectly, but... When I got here, everything was academia. We live on a street which was built sort of in the 1920s, entirely, you know, filled by with with people at Yale. Mm-hmm. So it's, we're like in an we live in an academic community, 
But there was nothing for us to do at Yale, really. So that's when I sent a letter, just a cold letter, you know, cold call thing, <laughs> to uh, Roseanne Somerset, who's the president of RISD. And she responded. And I said, I'd love to just, if you're ever open to be just giving a talk or something, I just to do something, okay? And she, like, came down to see me. And she was so welcoming and kind that... It, we got real involved, Franklin and I, with this. And um, we're actually now, we have titles. We are senior presidential advisors. <laughs> that so, sounds pretty fancy. We, it sounds fancy. But I, they made it up, of course. But it's like a Wizard of Oz thing. <laughs> what I like about it is we also are charged with doing two major, in quotes, events uh, that are for all school, uh, all departments, twice a year, one for each term. And we just did our first a few weeks ago, and it went really well. And it was it's so interesting to me because, um, you know, I have limitations about what I can can't do. We're running around doing the museum thing. I, I'm working in a lot of different arenas. Um, I was advisor to the, at the time, president of George Jensen. I opened up China for them as with a, you know, as, as an advisor, and I did all this stuff. But like now, it's it's less, it's not so easy for me to do that. So I I like the idea that it sends students to us when we started. Um, we set up in the attic a little classroom thing, and this bus arrived with students, <laughs> <laughs> and we had this four-hour class. They drove two hours on the bus to get here and two hours back, which was unbelievable to me. And we did that a few times. A bee in my bonnet about this this interdisciplinarity. The fact that there were all these departments that were, were had access to each other, that were in fact living in close proximity, but there was remained still the, the towers, you know, the individual towers that they occupied that they occupied and and, and worked with it. They were like the old medieval guilds. And I thought, this isn't going like, the world isn't going in that direction because from my perception, it's more generalist. Like one needs, a designer needs to know kind of everything or how to supplement what they do, but they know what they need, what's needed, as opposed to, I just do glass, I just do this. Because people were designing things that required multiple disciplines. How young was working in textiles, but then they were also were married to glass, you know, that had a little bit of, of ceramic included. Like people were doing multi-material things, you know, and I thought that if that's where it's going, then we need to change the system. So I proposed that to Roseanne, who was very much on board with that anyway. And so... It's, I feel I feel like I found the, the next thing for us, you know, which is so nice. We work sort of quietly and privately, but we have the, the best audience, which is the next generation, you mm-hmm. know. So I feel that we're not written off as the, you know, we, we can we can have a slight effect, hopefully, on um, and be therefore a part of the future. I'm. Excited to hear that it's feeding you because I'm quite confident that it's feeding the students. And it's such a wealth of experience and insight that you've amassed in your time. I mean, I'm sure it feels good to share that with the next generation. And it's it's an important transfer yes. of, of information, I think. The only problem I'm having is I have Parkinson's. It's progressive. You know, I've had it for a long time, but and I'm fine. But it's 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 actually now I'm going to the next level, so I'm more symptomatic. I'm very, very self-conscious about that because I don't want it to be about that. But but I I appear differently, I move differently, you know, and it's and it's it's not what I of course what I want, but I'm trying to come to terms with that because I I want to communicate something, and I don't want it to be through that venue, that vehicle, but it's all I have. It's me. But it's, it's, from a distance, an interesting challenge because some things I can't control at all, so I have to go with it and yet not have it be about that. So I like, but I like doing that. I like thinking about that. I know for me, one of the things that in, at my age that I'm finding incredibly valuable is 
watching how people navigate the various stages of life and the role models for how they kind of navigate yeah. with grace and with tenacity and how they stay vital even while, you know, their body may be behaving or breaking yeah. down in ways. I think what's incredibly important about what you're doing is the fact that you are still using your voice. And you're also, even though it's not your message, by doing it through Parkinson's, you're sharing a way of staying vital and, yeah, and relevant. Think, and I yeah. think that's that's a very important and valuable subtext to the whole thing. No, I appreciate that. I talk a bit, talk about change and you guys are with it, you know, but it's very hard to, to when you really see yourself as not with the same, in the same situation as you used to be, mm -hmm. you know, you know, it's depressing. But, but what I like is to make that into something, what choice do I have to make it into something good for me, you know, that, that I could still feel, and people are, are very nice and so it's okay. I'm not sure because it's just, you know, things happen in life. Like we had a sale once. Um, we rarely had a sale, but we had a sale of damages years ago. And Franklin set out a card. And on, on, a, on the postcard, when it said on one side of the card that you don't really have a picture or something, it just said, shit happens. <laughs> and, and, and what it was was, we, that's what our trucker had said when we said, how can we have so many damages? He said, shit happens. <laughs> so, so sometimes that's, the only way you could say it, you mm -hmm. know, it should happen. So what are you going to do? One of the things I'm really curious about is during the course of your career, I'm not sure where I read this, but I read it in, in an article. You said that you know how to look at something. And you've looked mm -hmm. at a lot of things, but it also implies that you have a way of seeing that's uniquely you. I wonder if you can break that down for us. Like, is it something that you understand well about yourself? Is it something that you feel in your body when you see something that it's, that's intriguing to you? Is it what you talked about earlier, which is something in the relationship intrigues you enough? I think we, we would have to agree that although we are, you, let's say you and I are looking at the same thing, mm -hmm. we're not seeing the same thing. Correct. Because I'm seeing it through my filter and you're seeing it through your filter. And what I might think is beautiful, you might think is hideous. And possibly it's because I'm reading all the baggage. I had a great experience with this and blah, blah, blah. And so that became my definition of beauty. And you had had a negative experience with some aspects of this thing we're looking at, which has led you to feel that those, that's unattractive. I believe that that's true, that we, we, none of us are really looking at the same, we're looking at the same thing, but we're not seeing it in the same way. That's for everybody. It's not a talent. It's just it's a, hu it's a human trait. And so when I look at things, I drag with it everything that I've ever seen. And I love going to markets. I used to love going to Frankfurt. I went to so many markets every year. But Frankfurt was the killer. I'd go to the, the Frankfurt Fair in February every year. I'd do 10 buildings, 10 floors each. And I went to look at everything made, every single thing. And so I had an unusual reference, you know. So I would look at something. I would then have to compare it against everything I've seen, for, which was a lot of stuff. Yeah. And that was different, obviously, than, than somebody normal. Who? Why would you go look at vacuum cleaners? So I would look at everything just because I loved it. I really loved it. And, and I wouldn't use any of it. What I started to feel was I went not one of the big differences I think between me and other buyers, let's say, was I didn't go there to look at things not wanting to like, looking to see things I didn't like. Okay, I didn't want to say I never said I wanted to like everything. That was my agenda. And in order to fall in love with everything, I had to. I constantly was more than the benefit of the doubt. I would say the old me doesn't like this or the present me doesn't like this, but I'm wrong. Why, what is there that is great about this? I had a very positive attitude toward things, and I would change my mind very often. So I was open to, like, you're right, I'm wrong. Explain to me, though, so I, I can understand this. That was what I liked doing. I worked with a few people in the job of the buyer, you know, 
and I would go to fairs with them, but I would go wanting to buy everything. Mm-hmm. And then I would get back to New York and realize that had I done that, I would have been crazy. So I, that's maybe what people like me is I'm open to anything. That's the fun. I just, I don't buy it until I get home because then you imagine it in New York. You're in New York, you're sitting there with a coffee, looking at a brochure, and you realize that isn't going to work here. Yeah. But when you're there, the, the aim is to fall in love with it because it, it works to your advantage. Well, and it helps train your sensibility towards the future. It's a very forward-thinking method. I think one of the things that's difficult about this sector, you know, the industrial design, let's say, is people have a criteria that they they have baggage, they bring with them, and they don't want to let it go. Like when I was selling this really thin Lohmeyer glass, thin, 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 (laughs) totally breakable easily, okay? People would say... How could you do that? That's a bad glass. And my I, my feeling was, why do you think I bought it? Okay, and they would go, I have no idea. But the people hated it because it was breakable. And I said, well, what else do you have breakable in your life? Nothing. You we're so spend all our money and all our time and our energy to protect us from this, that, and the other thing. What happens if we? through evolution, get rid of vulnerability. Would you like to be a person that is never vulnerable, never feels vulnerable? Are you willing to give that up? And I said, this is an area where I think people, some people can afford to be vulnerable because it's a, it's a wine glass, for God's sake. But you'll feel a loss if you break it. It will be a loss to you, and you can cherish that. Like that's that's a, an argument that is not a normal argument for glass, I grant you. But, but that's what I would coming around to that kind of stuff. And I, I looked hard at these things, you know. That's something that I, I do, which is not, it's just because I'm sort of compulsive, which is I like to do the same thing over and over and over. I'll look at one glass for 10 days. Like I'll move it around, I'll, you know, which is it's, it's sort of a waste of time for most. But I like to really look at something. You just really left us with something very important, Murray, which is that an object such as a glass can be a metaphor for our own human vulnerability and fragility, and that you go through life wanting to fall in love with everything. And so I just want to thank you for sharing your story with our listeners so that you gave us all a chance to fall in love with you. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Who wouldn't have judged anybody about themselves? But thank you. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. And I think you're great. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks for listening. For images and more info on Murray Moss, Moss Bureau, Torpedo House, and the RISD Moss collaboration, head to the show notes by clicking the link in the details of this episode on your podcast app, or go to cleverpodcast.com where you can also sign up for our newsletter. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Clever on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like these interviews, please rate and review. We also love chatting with you on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find us at Clever Podcast. You can find me at Amy Devers. Clever is created and produced by me, Amy Devers, along with Jamie Derringer. Our production company is 2VD Media with editing by Rich Straffolino and music by L1011. Clever is proudly distributed by Design Milk. Real quick, before we let you go, here's another reminder to check out Finnish Design Shop for modern Scandinavian furniture, lighting, and accessories. Head to finishdesignshop.com slash clever to get their special offer for clever listeners.